Welcome back to Paleo Talks. We are on episode 56. Uh, I think that's correct. David yep. is nodding. Excellent. <laughs> and this week we have Dr. Andrew McDonald with us, coming all the way from uh, the western half of North America. How are you doing, Andrew? Doing well. How are you? We're doing well. We're doing Good. well. And uh, we've just been talking a little bit about backgrounds in Illinois and, and St. Louis and Missouri uh, in those areas. And uh, we haven't had a lot of dinosaur talks. And it looks like this is going to be a real mixture of spanning the, the whole spectrum. <laughs> Chris, are you going to start working on dinosaurs as well as Ice Age like, like Andrew here? Oh, what, I, I'll put it this way. Once we figure out gonfathiers, you bet <laughs> the, the sky's the limit. But uh, until then, you know, there's a there's yeah, there's some things that we got to figure out first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump over to David and he can remind everybody how the show works. Sure thing. I'm David. I am uh, the guy in the chair. I'm running all the tech stuff and I'll be moderating questions. So here in a little bit. Uh, we're going to give our guests the chance to start off the presentation. And then once that presentation winds down, the rest of the program is going to be Q&A time. So our panel of people here will have some questions, I'm sure. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So at that point, we will remind you that if you have a question for our guest, go ahead and leave it as a comment in our Facebook comment section on the video. And as always, if for any reason you can't leave a comment on Facebook, feel free to send your comment, your question to us at the Gray Fossil site, Twitter or Instagram. I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. All right. Thank you, David. And to remind everybody, we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee, where we oversee the research at the Gray Fossil site and museum out there. I'm actually on the main campus today. This might be the first time I've done this, maybe the second, I'm not sure. Jumping around all over the place lately. Always got my camera with me. Uh, wherever we are, we do the show. And let's, let's get into the introductions with Andrew. And Andrew, you've seen the show before. And what we like to do to get things rolling is just to have you tell us about yourself, how you got into paleontology in the first place. Uh, the road that you took in your career, the universities that you went to, and, and what got you interested in the topics that you studied. So mm -hmm. welcome again. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my road into paleontology, um, I guess, began uh, before I can even remember, according to my parents. Um, dinosaurs, natural history, fossils were just uh, uh, something I was uh, deeply interested in from a very, very early age. Um, so they would read me dinosaur books and um, try to teach me all the Latin and Greek names, how to pronounce them. Um, and yeah, so it's been, paleontology has been an, uh, an interest of mine for pretty much my entire life. Um, I would say as far as deciding to make it my career path, I was um, a little bit too young when Jurassic Park came out in 1993. So I know a lot of my colleagues, um, especially people who work on dinosaurs got into it because of Jurassic Park, but um, my parents wouldn't take me to see it back in 1993, I was too young. So for me, it was um, kind of the, the career moment was when Walking with Dinosaurs premiered in 2000 in the US. Um, and that was just a, a really magical experience for 14-year-old um, me uh, to be able to, it was like the, taking that leap from seeing dinosaurs as just items on a page uh, in books, which obviously were, were very um, educational and, and gave me a lot of information, but that leap to seeing them as really living animals in a very rich habitat. Uh, since they did such a good job in that show of not only presenting the dinosaurs, but also talking about the plants and the climate that was going on at the time. So really presenting it as a whole rich world. Um, and that kind of really clicked something in my mind that, you know, the this, this science is capable of exploring these um, much bigger questions, as well as figuring out the dinosaurs themselves, looking at a, a wider world as well. So, um, so I, when it came time to go to uh, college, I went to University of Nebraska uh, in Lincoln, uh, got my degree in geology. Um, and that was really a good experience, got a, a good solid background in a lot of aspects of geology. 
uh, as well as paleontology, and uh, I took a lot of biology classes as well. Um, and also got the chance to see um, a wider range of fossils. I, I had visited a couple of museums before then and I'd seen uh, dinosaur fossils, uh, but in Nebraska, the big strength of their collection is Cenozoic fossil mammals, uh, like what you guys are finding at Gray. Uh, so that, gave, that also gave me kind of a, a broader perspective on the types of animals that, uh, that were out there after the dinosaurs. Um, yeah, being able to see a, a new fossil collection is, is always enlightening. Um, and then after that, I went on to University of Pennsylvania and got my PhD in paleontology, uh, working with uh, Peter Dodson, um, who's a, a dinosaur paleontologist. Um, and for that, I worked on a group of dinosaurs called the iguanodonts. These were uh, large plant-eating dinosaurs. Well, not all of them large, mostly large plant-eating dinosaurs um, that were around mainly during the Cretaceous period. And they include things like uh, Iguanodon, uh, which was the second dinosaur ever to be scientifically described back in 1820, uh, 1825, um, as well as the Hadrosaurus, the, the duckbill dinosaurs, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, and so then after that, uh, I uh, worked for a little while at the St. Louis Science Center, uh, which was made, which was a a really good experience because that was a, a little bit of research, but it was also, um, it was mainly a, a, an outreach uh, and education position, which is something I hadn't done much of before. Um, so that was a really good opportunity to, to hone those new skills. And then I got the uh, job as curator out here at the Western Science Center, um, which uh, as I'll explain in my talk has been a really uh, fulfilling, uh, productive experience. And how long have you been there, Andrew? Uh, four years. Every time I hear iguanodon, I think about the the thumb versus the nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's the one of a, a great example of um, uh, a fossil that we now think of as still very unusual, but that we have really well figured out. Like the the anatomy of iguanodon is as well known as a lot of modern animals because it's known from a lot of complete skeletons. People have done muscle reconstructions. They've studied how jaws work, uh, jaw mechanics. Um, you, know, you know, some iguanodonts even have skin impressions, so we, can, we know what the pattern of scales would have looked like. So it's like with iguanodon, about the only thing we don't know as far as its appearance was, was, it, is, was its color. Uh, the rest of its anatomy is pretty well understood. Um, so that the iguanodon hand is a, is a five digit hand, just like a human hand uh, with a thumb, three and with a thumb and then four fingers. Um, in Iguanodon, the thumb is a big conical spike coming off the middle of the hand. And then the three middle digits are uh, very robust with large uh, hoof-like claws on them, uh, probably for weight bearing. And then the fifth digit is uh, much more uh, slender and more flexible. Um, so it's, I, I've heard, I can't, I can't remember who said this, but one of my colleagues has referred to it as the Swiss Army hand. It seems to have a little bit of everything. It's got spike, it's got weight bearing digits, and it's got this free flexible fifth digit. Um, so back in the 1820s, when they were first finding fossils of iguanodon, uh, they didn't find complete skeletons until the 1880s. Um, so in the 1820s, when they were finding just the, the first fragmentary disarticulated iguanodon fossils, they found uh, one of those conical thumb spikes. And the best modern analog they could really find was like the horn of a rhino. Uh, so in the first reconstructions of Iguanodon, including the, the famous statues at uh, Crystal Palace Park outside of London, they put that uh, spike on the nose as a horn. But then a couple of decades later, when they found some nice complete articulated skeletons in Belgium, uh, then they realized, no, it's actually the thumb, it's part of the hand. So what do you all think it was actually used for? It's a good question. And um, I think that the best answer is we don't know. Uh, it could have been uh, defense, maybe fighting amongst themselves, maybe pulling down tree branches, vegetation, maybe all of the above. Um, yeah, as, as with many unusual structures like that, we just don't know. But all There's of them a... seem to have had it, is that correct? Uh, most of them did. Um, the, uh, the, a lot of the early Cretaceous uh, iguanodons, like iguanodon itself, 
had big thumb spikes. Um, but by getting into the late Cretaceous, when the hadrosaurs start to appear. So hadrosaurs uh, have a very similar hand overall, but they've lost the thumb. So hadrosaurs only have four digits on the hand. Uh, so yeah, so that's another question about the thumb spike is not only why did it evolve, why was it lost? So. <clears throat> All right, well, let's go ahead and move over to your presentation, Andrew. Sure. I want to share your screen. Right. All right, so yeah, I'll, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about um, research that goes on at the Western Science Center, uh, the projects I've been working on for the last four years. Um, and working at the Western Science Center is, has been really exciting for a number of reasons. And one of them is that this dinosaur specialist got the opportunity to branch out and look at some, some very different fossils, some much more recent animals, uh, Ice Age animals. So the Western Science Center itself uh, is in Hemet, California. So we're about 80 miles east of LA. Uh, the museum was founded in 2006 and we focus mainly on uh, paleontology and archeology. span Our collection has about uh, 2 million items in it, um, archeology span and uh, paleontology. Uh, we have, I think around uh, something like 100,000 fossil specimens. Um, mainly from here in Southern California, um, but also some, some other places as well, as I'll talk about. I haven't been there, Andrew, and I'm just curious, mm -hmm. where did these massive amount of collections come from all of a sudden? Well, so uh, the museum was founded in 2006 as uh, a place to house uh, a vast collection of Ice Age fossils that have been found very nearby. Um, uh, when they were uh, in the late 90s, they were excavating a huge uh, reservoir called Diamond Valley Lake. Uh, it's big, so it's a big man-made reservoir. And as they were digging down through the layers of sediment, um, it, it's, a, it's a gigantic area. Um, they found uh, two different um, layers of Ice Age fossils, uh, one around 16,000 years old and the other around 50,000 years old. Uh, so that's really exciting in itself to have two sets of fossils of similar animals, but living at two different points in time. So you start to kind of see if there are any changes that happened during those uh, thousands of years. Um, yeah, so this collection uh, from Diamond Valley Lake is huge, uh, and it uh, includes mastodons, uh, mammoths, uh, bison, camel, horses, uh, dire wolves, black bears, all sorts of uh, Ice Age megafauna, as well as a lot of uh, rodents and birds. Um, I think there's, uh, there's lizards and snakes, um, snails, uh, a lot of plants. So it's really a whole, um, kind of like what you guys have at, at Gray, you know, this whole uh, ecosystem captured there in, in one place. So the first topic I want to talk about, we're going to go uh, from talking about the Ice Age back to the Cretaceous period. Uh, so um, one of the projects that uh, my colleagues and I have been working on for a number of years is in a layer of rock called the Menifee Formation. And this is uh, an area in the San Juan Basin of Northwestern New Mexico. So kind of in the, uh, kind of right near the Four Corners area, um, that part of the state. And this is, uh, the Menifee Formation is essentially a gigantic uh, package of mudstone and sandstone and siltstone uh, coal uh, that was deposited uh, between about 84 and 78 million years ago. So that would be during the late Cretaceous epoch. So that's the very last division of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, so by this time, dinosaurs were <clears throat> extremely diverse. Uh, all of the uh, iconic dinosaur groups had appeared. Uh, including tyrannosaurs and horned dinosaurs, uh, as well as birds were also uh, around at this time. So this is a very uh, vibrant time in earth history. It's got this, this mix of uh, organisms that are no longer around like uh, giant non-avian dinosaurs like tyrannosaurs, as well as things that would to us look much more familiar. So there were birds, there were turtles, um, 
modern crocodilians had started to appear by this time. A lot of the plants uh, are, re are related to modern plants. So in a lot of ways, it would be this weird mix of the familiar and the bizarre in the, in the late Cretaceous. So for example, this is uh, a picture of one of the uh, in place fossilized uh, petrified tree stumps that we have found out there. Uh, so this is really exciting. This is, um, you know, this isn't just like a gigantic log that's fallen over and is uh, preserved in the rock. This is an actual in place tree stump uh, that's set, st that's still set in the mudstone, just where it was uh, 80 million years ago. And we found about 20 of these in place stumps out there, um, which is really exciting. Have so that's kind of into any of these to see if there are any vertebrates inside? Um, this one is still, um, as you can see, pretty well intact. Uh, some of the others have fallen apart more where you can kind of see the, the hollow space inside. Hmm. And I always look in there, keeping in mind the, the deposits up in Nova Scotia, yeah, um, where they find these, that's a, that's a much older deposit. That's uh, pre-dinosaurs. I think that's, um, that's Carboniferous, I think, isn't it? Um, and that's, so that's like around 300 million years ago. So before the dinosaurs, but they find these tree stumps uh, full of sediment and inside the stumps, they sometimes find little curled up skeletons of tiny vertebrates, so like um, early reptiles and early relatives of mammals uh, turn up in those. So we haven't seen anything like that yet in the Menifee, but we always peer into the hollow stumps, yeah, <laughs> just in case. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the Menifee Formation has been studied for uh, several decades by, by paleontologists. And in the uh, 1990s, uh, crews from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, uh, which is in Albuquerque, uh, were working in a, a different area of the Menifee Formation in New Mexico and um, found some, some, some pretty nice fossils. They found uh, uh, these two animals, uh, Brachycampsa, which is a, a very small, uh, relative of the modern alligator, and Menifeeceratops, which is a horn dinosaur. So that's a relative of Triceratops, but living about uh, 12 million years before Triceratops. And so all these uh, animals and plants, all these fossils that have been found in the Menifee Formation uh, over the years, um, these were all living on uh, the shore of what's called the Western Interior Seaway. So that's uh, this right here. So in the late Cretaceous, the geography of North America would have been pretty different from what it is today. Uh, the shape of the continent itself was pretty similar to what it is today. Uh, so when you see a, a picture like this showing these different land masses, it's not that the continent was splitting apart. Instead, it's that the interior of the continent, um, like all the way from Texas, all the way up to uh, Yukon and Alaska, uh, had been flooded by a, this warm, relatively shallow saltwater uh, seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. So uh, on either side of that, there was dry land. There was Appalachia out in the east uh, and Laramidia out here in the west. So New Mexico uh, was part of Laramidia. So right about where my mouse is, that's where these uh, creatures and, and plants from the Menifee Formation would have been living. So very close to the coast of that seaway. So today, this area of New Mexico is high arid desert. It's, um, we're up at around 6,000 feet elevation. Uh, it's extremely dry. The only trees around are those petrified stumps. Um, uh, but 80 million years ago, it would have been a flat, uh, very lush, forested, swampy floodplain uh, with rivers flowing out into the seaway. So very different habitat from what it is today. So over the last couple of years, my colleagues and I have started to publish uh, some of the discoveries we've made in the Menifee Formation. Uh, the first that came out was uh, this new dinosaur uh, that we published in 2018. This is uh, an armored dinosaur. It's one of the ankylosaurs. Uh, specifically, it's a type of ankylosaur called a notosaurid. <clears throat> so notosaurids have these very thick uh, armor plates. These are some of the osteoderms. And osteoderms are separate little bones um, that are uh, embedded in the skin. They were not uh, attached to the underlying vertebrae or the ribs, they were just embedded in the skin. And when the animal was alive, each osteoderm would have been covered by a large scale. Uh, so it would have looked a lot like uh, the back of a crocodile or an alligator that you might see today. 
so this was the first dinosaur that we published from the Menifee Formation. Uh, and it was a new species uh, of notosaurid uh, that we decided to call Invictarx zephyron. And that name means the invincible fortress of the Western wind. Uh, so invincible fortress because uh, like all, like other ankylosaurs, Invictarx would have been covered with these armor plates. They probably would have given it some good protection against things like tyrannosaurs. Uh, and then Zephyri uh, of the Western wind refers to the fact that whenever we're out in the Menifee, it's just very, very windy. Uh, and this, uh, the first skeleton of Invictarx that we found was very conveniently situated on a ridge about 20 feet up in the air. So we were up there on that ridge being buffeted by the winds trying to dig up the skeleton. So hence the uh, invincible fortress of the Western wind. Uh, we have found three specimens uh, that we've published so far uh, of Invictarx, uh, mainly consisting of uh, these distinctive osteoderms, uh, these armor plates. So it, Invictarx is still probably the, the least known of the dinosaurs we have found in the Menifee Formation. Uh, so we're always hopeful that we'll find more complete specimens um, at some point. So the, uh, the second new dinosaur uh, that we also named in 2018 uh, was a new Tyrannosaur. Uh, this is, we decided to call this Dynamo Terror Dynasties, which means the powerful terror ruler. And I chose the name Dynamo Terror um, because um, as, a, as a bit of a, uh, as a way to, to honor an old dinosaur name that's not used anymore, uh, which was Dynamosaurus. So the history behind that, um, in 1905, uh, a paleontologist named Henry Osborne uh, published a paper uh, describing two uh, large meat-eating dinosaur skeletons found in Wyoming. Uh, the first one of those skeletons he named Tyrannosaurus rex. And then one page later in the same paper, he named the other skeleton Dynamosaurus imperiosus. The very next year, Osborne published another paper showing that Dynamosaurus and Tyrannosaurus were in fact the same thing. But because Tyrannosaurus rex had been named one page earlier in the paper, it had priority. So that's the name that everybody uses now. So the name Dynamosaurus is no longer used by paleontologists. Um, but I came across that name uh, while reading um, a children's natural history magazine when I was a kid. Um, they, they used it in there, um, just kind of randomly. It was just a, in a caption for one of the, the pictures. Um, but I, I always liked that name. So when I had the chance to work on a new Tyrannosaur, I decided to honor the old name of Dynamosaurus and created the name Dynamo Terror, uh, the powerful terror ruler. So this was um, the, uh, the, the largest uh, meat-eating dinosaur uh, that we've seen in the Menifee Formation so far. Uh, it was a Tyrannosaur, so it's closely related to T-Rex, um, but it's a, it's a bit smaller and it lived earlier. So T-Rex didn't actually live until the very, very, very end of the late Cretaceous. Uh, T-Rex was one of the last dinosaurs on Earth, in fact, one of the last, I should say, non-avian dinosaurs, non-bird dinosaurs. Um, T-Rex was the last and largest of its kind, but before T-Rex, there were all sorts of somewhat smaller, um, but similar uh, tyrannosaurs living in North America and Dynamo Terra was among them. So we found uh, a, the original specimen um, was fairly fragmentary. A um, lot of pieces of the skeleton, um, it had been on the surface weathering for a long time before we found it. Uh, so a lot of the bones had started to, to break apart and shatter. Um, luckily though, uh, we were able to collect all that material and uh, among the pieces uh, were fragments that we were able to fit together to form the two frontal bones. So the frontal is, um, humans have frontal that forms our forehead. Um, in a dinosaur like Dynamotera, there's two separate frontal bones, a, a right and a left, uh, that basically form the forehead of the dinosaur. It's the top of the head between the eyes. So we were able to put together some of those fragments and uh, found that we had both frontals, right and left, of this individual. Um, so we were able to uh, reconstruct the bones and then we uh, laser scanned them and created 3D models of them and were able to make this, this reconstruction of what a, a nearly complete pair of frontals would have looked like by 
mirroring some of the uh, left frontal and then sticking it onto the right frontal and then duplicating that. So it gave us a, an almost complete pair of frontals that we were able to reconstruct. And these frontals had some distinctive uh, features on them compared to other Tyrannosaurs. So that's when we decided to name it as a new species, uh, Dynamotera dynasties. Um, so that was in 2018. Um, so it was really, really neat to be able to, to see that in the Menifee formation, there was this distinctive new Tyrannosaur that hadn't been found anywhere else. But we still didn't know much about it because that original specimen um, was very distinctive, but was also pretty fragmentary. However, um, we now have a second, much more complete specimen of Dynamo Terror um, from very nearby. Uh, so this is uh, the bones that we have of this particular individual. Um, and we're still studying this uh, at the Western Science Center and, and with our colleagues. Uh, so we have a lot of bones of the skull. We have um, bones of the shoulder, pelvis, uh, ribs, uh, vertebra from the tail. So uh, having that many skull bones especially was really exciting. And uh, luckily among those skull bones were both frontals. So we were able to directly compare this new skeleton with the original skeleton of Dynamo Terra. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and see that they are in fact the, the same species. So that's really exciting. So as I say, we're still studying this new uh, skeleton. Um, I will be giving a, a, a virtual talk on this new skeleton at the uh, online SVP meeting uh, in November. Uh, that's the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. Uh, so if anyone wants to tune in for that. Um, yeah, so very exciting. A lot more information on Dynamo Terror to come out um, over the next couple of years as we, as we keep studying this new skeleton. I think we always get a little bit nervous when we name something new and it, it must've been such a relief to get a second one uh, with more to it that actually had the frontal as well. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I never, I never dared dream that I would, one, get to work on a new Tyrannosaur and then find a much more complete second one. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so yeah, we're all very excited about this new skeleton, yeah. Uh, so the most recent uh, dinosaur that we've uh, published from the Menifee Formation uh, was a hadrosaur. So that's one of those duckbill dinosaurs that we were talking about earlier. And this was also a new species uh, that we decided to call Ornatops incantatus. That's the enchanted ornate face. Uh, we chose that name, uh, ornate face, because this animal would have had uh, some kind of crest uh, uh, on, its, on its head, uh, some kind of bony uh, crest, probably for visual display. And we haven't actually found the bone that forms the crest itself, but we do have, uh, again, the frontal bones. Uh, so that same uh, type of bone that I was talking about with Dynamo Terror. We also have those for ornatops here. And that's uh, in A here, you're looking at the, the back region of the skull, or you're looking at it from the top. So like this would be where the, the right eye is, and then the left eye would be over here. And the jaw muscles would be coming up through these two holes in the back. So the two frontals are this region up here, uh, the forehead. And that area is um, very, uh, it's a very uh, convoluted surface. It's got a lot of uh, ridges and grooves in it, some deep pockets, large bumps on it. And what that surface is, is the attachment point for the bone that would have formed the crest. Uh, so we don't actually have the crest itself, but we do have the bones that it would have to have attached to uh, when the animal was alive. So we know it had a crest. We don't know exactly what the crest would look like, but we, we know it had to be there. Uh, and then the, the enchanted comes from uh, the nickname of New Mexico, which is the land of enchantment. And for us working in the Menifee Formation, it's certainly been the case. We have uh, you know, the, the chance to work out there in, uh, you know, it would have been a, a really beautiful landscape 80 million years ago, and it's still a very beautiful landscape now. Very different one, but still um, really striking and, and a beautiful place to work. And so being able to be out there um, and finding these uh, these really cool dinosaurs and, and other fossils. Um, so it certainly has been uh, uh, an enchanting uh, place, to, place to be. Um, yeah, so as I said, Ornatops is a hadrosaur, one of the duck-billed plant-eating dinosaurs. And what we found of it was a, a partial skull and skeleton of a single individual. And so from the skull bones, we were able to reconstruct, uh, this is essentially the, the back third of the skull. So we don't have many pieces of the, of the snout and we don't have any of the lower jaw, but we do have most of the, of the back of the skull. 
Um, so like here in B is a side view looking at the, the right side in profile. Um, so the uh, right eye would have been over here in this uh, curved area. Yeah, so that's really exciting too. So we're, we're filling out the uh, list of, of Menifee formation dinosaurs because uh, there was Menifee ceratops that um, the crew from New Mexico Museum had worked on. And then we have found uh, Invictarx, the armored dinosaur, Dinotera, the tyrannosaur, and now Ornatops, the hadrosaur. So we're getting a good sample of these large dinosaurs from the Menifee formation. And then this is uh, another uh, piece of art by uh, Brian Eng. Um, so Brian also did the, the painting I showed on the previous slide of Dynamo Terror and Invictarx. Uh, and then this is his uh, reconstruction of Ornatops. Uh, so he has done some really beautiful, stunning work for us uh, over the years. So it's not just dinosaurs that we find in the Menifee Formation. Uh, we find uh, plants, uh, freshwater invertebrates, uh, bits of fish, uh, a lot of turtles, um, and several different types of crocodiles. So we're all st we're still um, in the early stages of studying most of those fossils. Uh, but the, uh, the first paper on one of our crocodiles came out earlier this year as well. Uh, and this was done by uh, uh, Ben Moeller, who is one of the uh, students that's working with us on the project. Uh, so this was his, uh, first, uh, his first paper, his first author. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and the specimen is also uh, pretty cool. This is, um, it's a, a fragmentary skeleton uh, with several osteoderms, so that's those bony armor plates, as well as a couple of vertebrae and some other bone fragments, uh, belonging to this animal called Dinosuchus. So Dinosuchus was originally named based on a skeleton from Montana uh, back in 1909. And since then has turned up in a lot of late Cretaceous deposits all throughout Western and Eastern North America. So it occurs on both sides of that Western interior seaway. Um, so it's found in, uh, there's a lot of specimens from Texas, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Utah. So it was a pretty uh, major component of these coastal ecosystems back in the late Cretaceous, uh, found all over North America. Um, this specimen though, was the first time that it had ever been found in the Menifee Formation. So that's pretty exciting. That's a whole new uh, part of, the, of this Menifee fauna that we're finding uh, is this giant uh, relative of modern alligators. So Dinosuchus would be, a full-grown Dinosuchus could be up to 35 or 40 feet long. So it's a truly enormous animal. Um, and yeah, so we found these, these armor plates which are very distinctive uh, in being very thick. So this is uh, compared to other, um, late Cretaceous crocodilians, uh, including some others that we have found in the Menifee Formation. Uh, these osteoderms are extremely thick, uh, kind of have this, this bulbous appearance. Um, so that told us uh, pretty clearly that this was, was Dinosuchus. Um, as I said, our skeleton is pretty fragmentary, so we don't know which species of Dinosuchus it is. There are three species of Dinosuchus currently recognized from, from various places in North America. Um, we don't know which one ours is yet, um, but we do know that this giant alligator, uh, Dinosuchus, was there in the Menifee Formation. So that's pretty exciting. So um, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, that kind of brings us all up to date on what we've been working on in the Menifee Formation. Uh, we've published several papers in the last couple of years, uh, but there's much more to come. Um, yeah. And what is known of Brachychamps from there? Uh, so yeah, that specimen that, that the uh, New Mexico Museum found uh, in their field area, uh, that's a uh, uh, one uh, partial skull that they found of, of Brachycamsa. Yeah, so Brachycamsa is, um, is much smaller than Dinosuchus, um, but this is not the only place where both, uh, where both of them are found. Uh, they're also both known from uh, uh, Grand Staircase National Monument in Utah. Uh, in fact, um, at the Natural History Museum of Utah in Salt Lake City, they have on display uh, two mounted skeletons of Dinosuchus and Brachycamsa. It's like Brachycamsa, it's like, it's not even, I think it's about four and a half feet long, little tiny little uh, crocodile or alligator, I should say. Um, and then right next to it is this 40 foot long Dinosuchus. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that's really exciting, you know, because we're finding this uh, pretty diverse set of dinosaurs. Um, we're also starting to see a lot of diversity among the turtles and also uh, quite a bit of diversity in the crocodilians. 
So that's pretty exciting. This was clearly a really rich, uh, diverse uh, ecosystem with all these different uh, uh, large animals living in it. So is, uh, are there other institutions that are currently doing excavations on this formation as well? Yeah, I think, um, I think the I'm not, I think the New Mexico Museum is still working in in their Menifee area. Uh, the um, the uh, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences also works in the Menifee. Um, yeah, so it's uh, which is good because there's it's good to have multiple institutions working in it because the Menifee covers a, a vast area. That's an enormous amount of outcrop. One institution couldn't possibly cover it all. Uh, so to have at least three institutions out there working in in different areas. Um, is is good it means we're going to find more. Yeah. So uh, the recent uh, culmination of all this work in the Menifee Formation has been uh, a new exhibit, a new permanent exhibit that we've just opened at the Western Science Center. Uh, just opened last month, and the museum had its its big public reopening after being closed uh, for a year and a half. Uh, but it gave us a chance to uh, put together some pretty cool new exhibits. And uh, one of them was this uh, called Prehistoric Pathways. Um, so it's all about the Menifee Formation uh, with uh, obviously Dynamo Terror playing a, a major role in it. We have uh, a uh, 3D printed uh, skeleton mounted up here on the wall with uh, 3D prints of the bones that we have from, from that individual, uh, as well as a skull reconstruction. And then uh, yet another piece of amazing artwork by uh, Brian Ang this uh, fantastic um, sculpture of Dynamo Terra's head uh, that people can, can walk around and get a full view of. Um, and then there's just a little hint of it over here, but Brian also made this amazing uh, mural that's on the wall here showing uh, ornatops and invict arcs and all sorts of plants um, that would have been around back then. So uh, yeah, and as you can also see, there's, there's room to add things as well as we continue to discover more about the medicine. So this, this exhibit will, um, will continue to grow, I'm sure, over the coming years. Uh, so that's really exciting. It's really been exciting uh, for me and for everyone involved in the project uh, to see uh, a decade of work represented in an exhibit like this. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to switch gears rather dramatically uh, for the rest of the talk. And uh, we're now going to jump ahead in time from the late Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs, to uh, a time period relatively recently. Uh, this would be during the late Pleistocene, uh, also known as the Ice Age. Um, so this was a time, obviously, long after the dinosaurs, the, the non-avian dinosaurs had gone extinct. So this is a time period uh, dominated by mammals as, as the largest animals on land. Um, and so uh, as we talked a little bit about the, earlier in the talk, uh, Western Science Center um, a lot of our fossil collection uh, is this material from Diamond Valley Lake, this uh, vast man-made reservoir that was excavated back in the 1990s. And so when they're excavating, they found uh, just an enormous quantity of uh, really excellent Ice Age fossils. Everything from uh, plants to invertebrates to lizards and snakes to bison to mastodons. Uh, just yeah, large and small animals and plants all preserved together. So really, really exquisite discovery. Uh, and among all that material is around 700 bones representing probably around 100 mastodons. So that's a really fantastic sample uh, to have of mastodons. Um, mastodons are um, related to elephants. Uh, so they're related to elephants and to uh, mammoths, uh, but they're, they're, they are their own group. Um, within that. Uh, they, the mastodons don't have any living descendants. Uh, so they, they all, the mastodon lineage went extinct around uh, 10,000 years ago at the, end of, at the end of the last ice age. Um, but during the ice age uh, and for several million years before that, uh, mastodons were uh, flourishing in North America, found all over the continent, all the way from, um, I think there's like a two, I think there's a tooth from Honduras all the way up to uh, Alaska and everywhere in between. Uh, so really successful. Uh, so living alongside the mammoths, which were also very successful, were uh, a different type of prehistoric elephant, the, the mastodons. So having this sample at Diamond Valley Lake uh, was really a, a great opportunity um, for, for us and for uh, a lot of our colleagues, such as Chris, 
Um, so in, uh, in 2017, um, Western Science Center hosted a, a, a small conference about um, mastodons. And so a lot of our colleagues, including Chris, came out to look at these fossils and uh, try to determine uh, what they what they meant, uh, what what these fossils could tell us about um, about mastodon evolution and ecology and extinction, um, and so that's there's there's an enormous amount of research that's now being done on these uh, mastodons from Diamond Valley Lake, um, and the the first paper on them uh, came out about two years ago. Uh, this was by um, uh, the executive director of the Western Science Center, uh, Alton Dooley, um, and a group of colleagues. Uh, published uh, the first really detailed description of these mastodons from Diamond Valley Lake, uh, including this specimen. This is uh, Max. So if any of your listeners follow the Western Science Center on social media, you will be familiar with Max. He's kind of the museum's mascot. Uh, but Max is a real animal. Max is a gigantic um, male mastodon uh, that uh, died when he was about 40 years old. And uh, is now represented by a partial skeleton that includes this just beautiful uh, skull uh, with the tusks. Uh, the lower jaw is also known. So uh, Max is has the best preserved skull of all these mastodons from Diamond Valley Lake, but there are many, many other skulls as well, uh, and a lot of jaws and a lot of uh, isolated teeth. So it's a really great sample uh, of the um, cranial anatomy of these mastodons from Diamond Valley. So uh, Alton and his colleagues um, started examining all these skulls. Um, and one of the things they noticed is that uh, the, uh, the molars, uh, especially the third molars of these uh, Diamond Valley mastodons were kind of unusual compared to mastodon molars from the rest of the country, uh, especially in being very, very narrow uh, for their length. So in this picture here from the paper, uh, over here on the left side, we have um, some molars from uh, Diamond Valley mastodons. You can see they're, they're pretty narrow, especially compared to the ones in this column, which are American mastodon molars. So for a long time, uh, it was thought that there was only one species of late Pleistocene mastodon in North America. And that is the, the classic iconic American mastodon, Mammut Americanum, uh, which has been known since the, um, uh, the late 1700s. Uh, it's been found uh, uh, especially large uh, uh, numbers of them from Florida, Michigan, uh, Colorado, Missouri, uh, New York, uh, but they're found all over uh, North America. Uh, so for so until 2019, it was thought that the American mastodon was the only late Pleistocene mastodon in North America. But then Alton and his colleagues found this consistent difference. So they, this is really important that they had many specimens to work with uh, from California, especially from Diamond Valley. And they were able to see that it was a consistent uh, difference uh, between mastodons from California and those from the rest of the country. That the ones from California always had these much narrower molars. So, the, and, and then as they began to delve more into uh, these, the anatomy of these specimens, they found other differences as well. Uh, differences in the lower jaw, uh, difference um, in, the, in the femur. Um, so it turns out that the mastodons from California probably represent a distinct species, something different from the American mastodon. So Alton and his colleagues named it uh, Mammut Pacificus, the Pacific Mastodon um, in 2019. And so it turns out that not only at Diamond Valley, but throughout the state of California, uh, all the mastodon fossils actually belong to the Pacific Mastodon, not to the American Mastodon. And then uh, in visiting other museums, they also found uh, some narrow molars from Idaho uh, that were consistent with the Pacific Mastodon. So in, so in that paper from 2019, they concluded that there was this distinct species called the, uh, that they called the Pacific Mastodon found in California and in Idaho. So that's kind of, uh, that's a little bit of, a, of an unusual geographic range because uh, there's, you know, there, there are definite American mastodons as far west as Colorado and uh, Utah and Arizona. 
Um, so to have this distinct species, the specific Mastodon in California, and then curving up into Idaho um, was, was kind of unusual. Um, so obviously that opened up a whole lot, uh, a lot of questions about um, not only Mastodon evolution, but also their geography and how that geography changed during the ice ages as glaciers would advance and then retreat and then advance and retreat again and again and again many times uh, during the ice age. Um, so yeah, so this, this was a really uh, landmark uh, piece of research, recognizing that there was this distinct species but that opened up a whole slew of new questions. And then just real quick, another uh, Brian Ng artwork interlude um, that, he, that he created this uh, uh, representation of, of Max and beating up one of his fellow mastodons. Um, Max actually has an injury on his lower jaw where the bone was uh, injured in some way and then uh, became infected. So it's got this huge uh, knobby overgrowth of bone on, on one side of the lower jaw, basically on one side of his chin. And uh, one possible explanation for that is that as male elephants do today, that, ma that male mastodon might've fought each other with their tusks face to face. Um, and that Max might've been smashed in the lower jaw by the tusk of another male mastodon. Uh, so my contribution to this uh, research on the Pacific mastodon came uh, last year and came very unexpectedly. Um, in 2019, I made a trip to the Museum of the Rockies up in Bozeman, Montana to look at um, their hadrosaur collection. Because at that time I was working on the fossils that would become ornatops, uh, our hadrosaur from the Menifee Formation. Uh, so I was up there mainly to look at dinosaur specimens, uh, but just kind of on the off chance, I asked them if they had any mastodon specimens in their collection. Um, and they did, uh, it's this, uh, this partial skull uh, so we're looking at, uh, here's two of the upper molars. Uh, so this is uh, in B, it's like you're looking up into the roof of the mouth. So it's got two upper molars and then the tusks would be coming out, uh, coming out here towards the, the right side of the image. So it's this nice partial skull of a, of a mastodon um, in, at the Museum of the Rockies. Um, and I measured the teeth, um, but even, even before I started measuring them, I could see just kind of at a glance, like, wow, those teeth are really narrow. So I, texted, so I texted Alton and I texted him my measurements and right then and there we concluded, oh, this is a specific mastodon. It has narrow molars. Uh, like the, the molars are way outside the range for American mastodon. So these, these molar proportions, these measurements were consistent with Pacific mastodon. So that was really exciting. This, is a, this would be a specimen of Pacific mastodon from Eastern Montana, uh, about uh, 500 miles farther, uh, 500 kilometers farther east uh, than the specimens from Idaho. So it's pulling that range even farther east um, and towards the, the known range of the American mastodon. Uh, so that's really interesting. And it's also interesting looking at when uh, this particular individual was alive. This skull is from deposits that date to somewhere between uh, 639,000 and 160,000 years ago. So that's a pretty large uh, age range. So we don't have really precise data on the uh, geological age of this individual. Um, but it has to be between those two uh, dates, 639,000 and 160,000. And that's really interesting because looking at the history of glaciers, of glacial advance and retreat in Montana, that uh, set of dates puts this specimen in what's called an interglacial period. So that's a time when uh, the glaciers had retreated from Eastern Montana. So instead of uh, a wall of ice, you had uh, open grasslands uh, and forests uh, in this area of Montana. So that's interesting uh, from a couple of points of view. It kind of, it might provide an explanation as to why this particular indiv individual was there at that particular point in time. That maybe when the glaciers advanced, they pushed mastodon habitats farther and farther to the south or to the west and the mastodons had to move with them. So that during glacial periods, the Pacific mastodon might've been pushed out of Montana. And this would be uh, consistent with some findings that um, one of our colleagues, uh, Grant Zazula and his team have been finding in uh, Alaska, where the, uh, <clears throat> there, are, there are American mastodon up there. And what they were finding was that uh, as the glaciers advanced uh, and 
uh, more forested habitats gave way to colder, uh, more grassland habitats, that the mastodons were pushed uh, out of the area. It seems that, uh, that mastodons prefer more forested habitats rather than open grasslands. Mammoths prefer grasslands, but mastodons seem to like uh, the forests, uh, some more uh, wetter and more vegetated habitats. Uh, so if, if what was happening in Alaska was also happening in Montana, then it's possible that the Pacific Macedons were kind of pushed out of Montana during a glacial period and then the glaciers retreated and the Pacific Macedons were able to move into the area and then maybe they were pushed out again by another glacial advance. Uh, so that might explain why this individual lived in Montana during an interglacial period. Um, now, that's, uh, this is only one specimen, uh, it's only one data point, so that all needs a lot more testing, needs a lot more fossils um, for us to really understand what was going on with um, Pacific Macedons and American Macedons and how their ranges changed as the glaciers uh, advanced and retreated. Did their ranges ever overlap um, or were they just always completely separate? Did they, because did they occur sometimes in the same places, but at different times? Um, so yeah, so still a lot of questions um, to answer with the Pacific Mastodon. Uh, so a really, really new and, and exciting uh, avenue of research for, uh, for me and for Alton and for a lot of our colleagues. I think this is one of those that caught us all sort of off guard and by surprise. Mm -hmm. And it is really exciting once you, at first you're like very skeptical and then you start looking at it and you're like, oh, well, there really is something here. Um, and uh, both Chris and I got to be involved in the, the genetic work um, that was recently done. And I, I don't recall whether or not there are any specimens that might be out there that can contribute to this that would be Pacificus in terms of genetic data. I think sure. there was some, there was some Alberta material. Um, and I try and remember if we had American Falls material on that, maybe emails on the, on the call, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is a really a neat area, Andrew. And, and uh, for mastodons anyway, because it, it seems like we have a lot of genetic diversity there. Uh, so seeing this morphological diversity too, um, really kind of you're like what something is going on here it's time mm -hmm. and space confounding each other um but uh the other other aspect of this is that i i just love the fact that we thought that these things were all the same uh up until 2018 and then it was like okay there's two of them and now, even now, we're looking at it. Okay, these are these are these teeth are are not the same. They are very very different in some ways. And genetically, it's under it's kind of underscores the these different uh, kind of evolutionary histories of some of these different populations. So I think it's really cool. This is really exciting time to be doing mastodons. I will note. This is another Paleotox episode that started out in dinosaurs and ended up in proboscideans. You know, what's um, really funny about this is that um, <laughs> I asked Chris for suggestions of people to invite, and he, he said he gave me a few people, and you were, you were on that list, Andrew, but, but I looked you up, and I knew you were going to work on dinosaurs, so that I knew you work on dinosaurs, so I was wondering, you know, what the connection was, and then I realized, oh, it's the Science Center. But not until you gave your presentation did I realize that Chris tricked us into an yet another proboscidean presentation. <laughs> it's all yeah. part of a bigger plan. Yeah. They... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to paraphrase Monty Python, no one expects mastodons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. But I, still, I circling back to what I was asking, um, is was was something more that was morphologically pacificus uh, based on a tooth included in the genetic work that was done? I I Andrew, if you if you have an answer to that, go for it. I don't it. remember. I don't think that there it was in that uh, case. In fact, Emil and I have gone back over some of that, and and we've sent specimens to Alton and mm -hmm. you. And yes. said, is this Pacificus? Is that Pacificus? And I don't think that we've had anything yet. Um, there's a couple of things kind of in the hopper right now that um, might give us some Pacificus DNA. And uh, I know that you guys are kind of continuing uh, mm -hmm. your Pacificus work and trying to kind of 
put boundaries around what is this morphology of these Western uh, mastodons. Um, what, where, I mean, are you, are you comfortable kind of talking about a little bit of where this is going? I mean, you and I have even emailed back and forth about Zygolophodon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this yeah. is wide ranging. Indeed. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, I know that, um, uh, yeah, Alton has been in touch with, with you and, and with Emil um, about some of these specimens. Yeah, so I think there's, there's work in progress that might answer some of those questions um, about morphology versus the genetic information um, and what that means for the geography. Um, yeah, and then uh, the, the neat thing about, the other neat thing about all this mastodon work is that it's, uh, it's like what we've been talking about is uh, these very late mastodons, these late Pleistocene Ice Age mastodons, but the mastodon family has a much longer history going all the way back into the Miocene uh, so that would be like around 12 to 15 million years ago. Uh, so there's fossils of early mastodons when they were when they just uh, came over into North America. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, material over in Asia uh, that probably belongs to members of the mastodon family. Uh, so things like uh, like what Chris mentioned, Zygolophodon. Uh, Zygolophodon is one of those earlier members of the mastodon family um, that is known from quite a few fossils, um, but much like the Ice Age mastodons, uh, the, the taxonomy um, probably has some unexpected surprises in it. Uh, so there's still a lot of work being done on that as well. Um, I know Chris is working on some of that and some of our colleagues in, uh, in China are working on some of those. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's not just these Ice Age mastodons that are providing a really fruitful ground for, for new discoveries. Um, this whole 12 million year history of mass on evolution um, is, uh, is a really exciting field. And I'm sure that the, the one you guys have been excavating at Gray, I'm sure will have a lot to contribute to that, to that story. Well, that's one of the things I wonder, um, you know, in looking at this is that if you look at the teeth of our mastodon, um, it looks like the Eastern mastodon. So our, our 5 million year old mastodon looks like the Eastern variant. And so is this potentially a really um, you know, a, a deep separation and a long-term pattern. And when I look at those ones in the West, well, they remind me of Zygolophodon um, more than more than the Eastern. But I'm sure there are some some morphological characters in there too. That it's, what do you think on that, Chris? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, the the I, actually, you know, I always kind of approach mastodons with the idea that there's there's a heartland for mastodons you know you go to the midwest and they're everywhere or you go even to florida or the southeast you know we have a lot of mastodons here you don't normally think of california for mastodons but for the mile pliocene that's where they are that was the heartland of mastodons you know seven million years ago uh we've got so many specimens for for california southern california we've got so many specimens in nevada um and it's i mean it, it, i mean it, it's an order of magnitude smaller than what we see during the pleistocene but it's also much older and the kind of the cool thing is and this is something that we haven't truly parsed out yet, but there may be some geographic differences even going back that far. So, you know, you look at um, the, the Zygolophodon that's in the ALF Museum and you look at some of the other material that's from Nevada and morphologically it's smaller and it's kind of distinct from Zygolophodon from Florida or from Canada. So it's, there, there's some, interesting patterns there just aren't very many specimens though and so it's really difficult to do these these kinds of studies where you're looking at statistical differences within two populations uh, rather you're looking at trying to get at differences between 12 specimens or something mm -hmm. like that so um, it gets real dicey real fast but with the gen genetic information certainly we've got you know splits that happened three and a half four million years ago so there's a lot of time for some of these populations to go their separate directions and kind of evolve independently. David, are you there? I sure <laughs> am. <laughs> I don't know if you had any questions. It looks like we're getting to the end of the hour here. Yeah, we're about at the end. We did get a couple of dinosaur questions from the audience. If you'd like to answer those, Andrew. 
Yeah, sure. I'll just a uh, real quick, um, quick acknowledgement slide. Uh, so just a, a lot of people and organizations to thank uh, for, for on both projects. Uh, the Menifee Project, a lot of my colleagues at the Western Science Center and uh, the organizations that we work with out there, the, especially the Zuni Dinosaur Institute for Geosciences and the Southwest Paleontological Society. Uh, and then also the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, which uh, provides our, our permits. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. And then I'll just finish up with uh, just a quick plug for the Western Science Center. Um, we currently have a, 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 an online um, silent auction going on um, as part of our Science Under the Stars fundraiser, which the fundraiser takes place tomorrow, but the uh, silent auction is going on now and continues through Sunday. So uh, if anyone wants to check that out, find that on the museum's website. So will your silent auction support more work in the Manafi formation or anything like that? Um, what, yeah, what is it going it, towards? Yeah, I think um, I think it'll, it'll. I think all the proceeds kind of just support uh, all the work that the museum does, uh, it's like research and education. Um, yeah, exhibits. Uh, yeah. Well, great. We're always excited to hear what's going on at the Western Science Center. They're sort of, uh, uh, we've done work with the Western Science Center, not only are our researchers familiar, but we've also done uh, educational collaborations. So we like to think of the Western Science Center as a, a, a very close group of fr a friend institution that is very far away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's wrap it up with a couple of dinosaur questions from the audience. Uh, these are going back to the early portions of the presentation. Uh, this first one goes way, way back to when we were talking about Iguanodon. Uh, Aaron, so Aaron is one of our uh, former graduate students here at ETSU. Aaron says, I noticed that Iguanodon spikes look similar to turkey spurs. Maybe they had a similar function. Is there any dimorphism in the thumb spikes? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. I, I, um, I don't think anyone's really looked at that, to my knowledge. Um, there is quite a sample of, uh, of thumb spikes, all from uh, the Bernissart deposit in, uh, in Belgium. So that's where uh, in, the 18, um, in the 1870s and 1880s, they excavated, uh, gosh, around three dozen uh, iguanodon skeletons, most of them complete and articulated. Uh, including the thumb spikes. So the, the sample for that kind of study might, uh, yeah, is probably available uh, since those animals were all uh, living at about the same time and place. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure if anyone's really uh, really looked at that. So. Very cool. And, I, and I there's a graduate there. student out there going, darn it. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there is a, a, a long and not very fruitful history of looking for sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there's, I think, kind of the, uh, let's see, there was a recent, well, there was a study in 1975 by Peter Dodson, who had been my advisor at Penn, uh, looking at protoceratops. Uh, that's the, the small primitive horned dinosaur from Mongolia that's known from, uh, gosh, dozens, maybe by now even hundreds of specimens. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of them, uh, all the way from... Um, really tiny juveniles up to, to fully grown adults. Um, and yeah, so like back in the 70s, his, his study was able to find some possible dimorphism between some of the adult sized skulls uh, that might've been uh, male and female. Um, and I think there was a more recent study looking at those findings. Uh, I can't, can't remember exactly what it said. Um, yeah, I can't remember exactly what that what that study concluded, but uh, but that some work along those lines has been done on protoceratops. Um, yeah, maybe someday there's a, a project to be done on iguanodon. Indeed, yeah, that would be that would be really cool to look at. <laughs> All right, our last question uh, and a, a fitting topic. We're going to go back to tyrannosaurs. <laughs> this is from Jenny, who asks. Uh, do you think tyrannosaurids would have become extinct even without the end Cretaceous extinction? Would they have been choking to death on all the volcanic activity that was going on? <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Yeah, um, well, uh, so like T-Rex itself is the latest known tyrannosaur in the fossil record. 
Uh, so that's the, the very end of the Cretaceous, like right before the, the KPG boundary. Um, T-Rex is actually very abundant in uh, places like the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. Um, you know, so some of the plant-eating dinosaurs like Triceratops are also really common, but fossils of T-Rex are really pretty abundant. Um, so, and that's kind of, that seems to be fairly true of, of other Tyrannosaurus as well, including some of the smaller earlier ones like, uh, like Gorgosaurus is pretty common in Dinosaur Park up in Alberta. Um, and, you know, even, you know, even though we only have two Dynamo Terror, those come from a really small geographic area that we've been working. Um, and we have found, you know, two, two partial skeletons. Um, so, and also uh, over in Mongolia, uh, Tarbosaurus, um, which is uh, another giant tyrannosaur, very similar to T-Rex, was very abundant um, in the rocks where it's found. So tyrannosaurs seem to have been very abundant, very successful parts of the faunas in which they occur. Um, tyrannosaurs or uh, giant tyrannosaurs like that are known only from the Northern Hemisphere, from North America and Asia. Um, at the same time in the Southern Hemisphere, there were large meat-eating dinosaurs, but they were completely different groups. Uh, things like uh, Carnotaurus, some of these really weird, uh, deep skull, really short-armed, um, uh, large meat-eating dinosaurs um, that were not closely related to tyrannosaurs. Uh, so tyrannosaurs were found only in the northern, hem the, the giant tyrannosaurs were found only in the northern hemisphere. Um, but they seem to be doing quite well right up until the extinction. Uh, it's a bit difficult to say that with absolute certainty because um, like over in Asia, we have, there are a lot of skeletons of Tarbosaurus, but Tarbosaurus lived a little bit earlier than T-Rex. So not right up until the extinction. There's no reason to think that Tarbosaurus went extinct. It's just that we don't have the rocks to, uh, to find its fossils in. Uh, the, the rocks that produce Tarbosaurus are around uh, 70 million years old. So that's a couple million years before the extinction. Um, so, you know, there's no evidence to suggest that Tarbosaurus was in trouble in Asia. Uh, it's just that we don't have the rocks to see either way. Uh, but over in North America, where we do have rocks that go right up until the mass extinction, the, the KPG boundary, uh, I think um, T-Rex is, is still pretty abundant right up until the boundary. Uh, so my guess would be that if not for the asteroid impact, that uh, giant tyrannosaurs like T-Rex would have continued uh, humming along, uh, at least for a little while. So who know, you know, groups, groups disappear for, it doesn't always take a mass extinction for things to go extinct. There's, there's always this background level of extinction. Uh, so it's entirely possible that if tyrannosaurs hadn't gone extinct 66 million years ago, maybe they would have gone extinct 50 million years ago, who knows? Or they might still be around today <laughs> as giant armless terrors. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. But yeah, it, it seems that uh, up until the KPG, they, they, at least in North America, there is evidence that they were doing, that they were still doing fine. Very cool. A good couple of questions. And thanks, as always, to all of our uh, viewers for sending in questions. Thanks for watching and thanks for asking questions. It's always fun to get that input from the audience to throw our guests some uh, sometimes unexpected questions to make them think. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, Andrew, for joining us today. And everybody out there, make sure and check out the Western Science Center in person and uh, on all the online uh, aspects that they have to, to join in on. So we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Andrew. Thanks, everyone.